What we're going to do now, we're going to continue with the color processing, uh, 45 minutes, followed by motion processing, Krista. Okay, so uh, <coughs> we talked about uh, uh, some basically uh, early mechanisms in, uh, in cortex, uh, V1 uh, and also retina. <coughs> but now let's see uh, how we perceive color. Uh, <coughs> So as I said, basically to see, we need, uh, we need three things. Uh, a light source that emits light, uh, <coughs> sorry. Uh, objects or surfaces that basically can reflect uh, the rays and uh, a camera, an eye, right? Uh, so basically what we see is a function of uh, multiple things. The light source, the reflectance, and the physics, the physiology of the light and perception, right? Three players. Uh, so, uh, if you look at the the electromagnetic spectrum, we just see a we just see a narrow band in this uh, spectrum, uh, the visible uh, band, uh, and basically uh, that's from uh, 400 to 700 nanometers. Uh, so. Then this, uh, the, the, the high energy uh, photons, basically, uh, they form the blue light, uh, the, the, low, uh, the high frequency, short wavelengths, uh, and uh, usually they have a high energy. Uh, the, the right part, the lower energy photons, uh, basically red light, and uh, they have a, a basically high wavelengths. Uh, Somewhere in the middle, the visible light, uh, basically, we get uh, basically a, a compromise, uh, which what we can see. So, and then, basically, this, this narrow band from seven, 400 to 700, that's where, uh, where the sun basically radiates uh, the electromagnetic uh, magnetic energy. Uh, so, uh, as I mentioned, uh, there are two, to, to really understand uh, image formation and also color vision, we need to know a little bit about the physics of the light. Uh, two properties pertaining to, to understanding color perception. One is basically wavelengths, and the other one is the, uh, the energy or the number of photons emitted, uh, which is uh, basically if you want uh, to, have a, uh, to have a light source, basically, uh, you can represent that uh, basically as a distribution which shows in which wavelengths or frequencies how many photons you have. And that fully describes uh, that light. So this is a monochromatic light. Uh, and so this is another light which is basically you just have uh, some wavelengths, just few, let's say one. This looks like a uh, like a Dirac function, right? This is uh, laser light, neon laser light. Uh, so basically, here is another illustration of that. Any patch of light can be completely described by its spectrum, uh, which is the number of photons uh, per time unit at each wavelength. So this is basically, uh, if you have a basically a profile like this, uh, that's sort of one description of the light. You can have uh, air, just some more examples. Uh, ruby laser, for example, you just have just at one freak wavelength, uh, one wavelength you have, you have photons uh, or phosphide uh, crystal. Uh, that's the profile of, of, of the light that uh, you get. Uh, tungsten light bulb, for example, more towards reddish. Uh, and in the normal daylight, you sort of have all the frequencies uh, represented. Uh, so, so here is yet another more exa another example. So, uh, polychromatic li light, basically. So, monochrome is would be just one wavelength, but polychromatic, you will have uh, more wavelengths, and the fluorescent. Uh, shown at the bottom, you get two peaks, one corresponding to a reddish orange and one corresponding to a greenish yellow. Uh, and, 
so the color perception is, is difficult because that also entails how we make sense of. These are just identity physical properties, um, which basically objects are not really colored, right? So this is just the profiles that uh, we get and our brain makes sense, gives them different, different colors. Uh, so this dates back, basically, we'll get back to that. But so if you, for, to see an object as red, uh, basically, all this, uh, if you have a wh white uh, uh, light source, you have all the frequencies, uh, but then the one that is actually the, the color object gets absorbed, in this case, let's say the red, uh, the red frequencies, basically the, the higher wavelengths will be, get, get, will, will be absorbed by that object. So, sorry, everything else but red will be absorbed. Uh, so in this case, red will be projected back. Okay, all other light, all other frequencies will be absorbed by the by the object. Uh, so this is another. So for a green object, for example, the green frequencies the, the basically will be will be projected back, reflected. Uh, so here's are some examples. Uh, so. Uh, uh, a red object, for example, you see that you get higher frequency, basically higher wavelengths. Uh, uh, so that's the profile you get for the yellow. A banana, for example, you get more yellowish. Uh, basically, it's going to be green and red. A blue, uh, blueberries, for example, uh, more uh, towards left. Uh, higher frequencies, uh, shorter wavelengths, and a purple, which is more reddish and bluish. Uh, okay. So, uh, so what happens now is uh, is this, right? So we have this radiant energy, which is uh, the the. So we have a surface, right? And the surface, just like what I showed here, you can get basically this is this is the light that is absorbed from that surface, the the, the profile, basically the spectrum, and so you also have one corresponding to the light source, which is illumination, right? And what we get at the end, basically, you project that the, the, the spectrum of the light source, in this case, let's say skylight, on an object with that surface uh, reflectance, and you basically, what you get is just a point-wise multiplication of these, which is at the end of the day what, you perceive, what we perceive, right? Uh, which is going to be the energy of the light reflected. Uh, so basically, the multiplication of R and E in this case would be the, the reflected energy. Uh, so it basically it could happen that if you shine a different illumination on the same surface, eventually you will get a different you will get a different uh, reflection. Uh, so what what's uh, happening here? So under skylight and sunlight, you may see the same object differently, uh, but our brain sort of can sort of decode this process. And uh, so we can kind of understand, understand this. Uh, so what I'm saying is that uh, the same object, so basically this is known as color constancy. Uh, basically, so if, if you have just the, the, the byproduct, the, the end product, right, this reflected light, and from that you want to basically figure out what is the illumination and what is the surface reflectance? You can't do this because this is underspecified, right? Uh, so what our brain does basically, we do we make some assumptions and uh, uh, from the f basically structure of the board and things like that, we can sort of get an estimation of like, for example, where is the light source located and shadows and everything. We get an idea about the the, the actual color of the object. So here is an example of that, right? So this is the same uh, scene <coughs> under sunlight and skylight, uh, but you see that you get two different reflectances, uh, basically shown at the bottom. And uh, so this, in, in computer graphics, so if you have an image like this, there are algorithms that you can actually do this. You can figure out, you can break this down to a reflectance map shown at the bottom left and the illumination map, so uh, basically one is course reflectance map is corresponding to that surface property and illumination would be the, basically the, the light source and, and, and such. And uh, so if you can decode this now, you can basically play with it, right? You can change the illumination map and such, right? So for example, here you have an image 
well, the, 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 the left side of the face is sort of shadowed, which is unpleasant. And if you can break it down, you can now basically uh, fix that or even uh, change the color and things like that that you want. Uh, okay, so uh, it's just some more examples of of the the the, the, sp the spectrum of the basically the the light reflected from uh, different wavelengths for different uh, uh, for different uh, objects. Uh, so here, for example, if you can see. So this is light reflected from the white piece of paper. You see we have all the frequencies. Uh, but from an apple, for example, looking more at like the reddish, we have higher, uh, sorry, higher wavelengths. And, uh, and here we see tomato, for example, reddish, some bluish objects. Would be here, for example, ultramarine French blue, which is more basically our uh, blue, small short wavelengths. Okay, uh, so as I mentioned, right? Uh, so this is also well uh, mentioned by uh, Newton. The rays are, to speak properly, not colored. Uh, it's just that our visual system. This is the perception that we get. Real objects are. Uh, it's, it's just if this the perception of the color. Uh, so this this basically it goes back to to uh, of course Newton with the prism experiment and and uh, Thomas Young with those theories of light uh, and then uh, trichromaticity, which is basically just three colors are enough to to basically build all the colors in the world, and they also. Uh, uh, basically had some predictions that uh, our visual system also needs just three types of uh, of sort of sensors to sort of make sense of color of all the colors and later on those predictions uh, turned out to be true uh, so now if you look at the, the CCD matrix shown at the bottom left right you see this is uh, this is how uh, actually the cameras work right so we have this uh, we have this uh, buyer uh, pattern buying grid so for each pixel and now you basically make a couple measurements right uh, and the, for those four measurements and basically then you take the average of those uh, and basically from that you can figure out what is the color for each pixel uh, but if you look at the uh, if you look at the uh, the human uh, retina, right? Uh, so this is basically the the ganglion cells uh, color coded. So you see that uh, so these are from three different subjects. Uh, you see that this is basically nothing really uniform, and you have different uh, number of uh, of uh, let's say blue. The S uh, uh, short wave lenses, which are a smaller, a smaller number, and uh, it doesn't really look very, very uniform, and also it depends on different people. Uh, uh, so what we do basically, again, for each which location, we sort of the neurons look at the a, a spatial <coughs> region and take the average of those, so we can sort of get an idea about the color of of each location in the visual field. Uh, so this is just illustration of that very great. Now, so how do, how, what is the, uh, the, the, the ganglion cells that, that do this? We have two types of, of photoreceptors, as we mentioned. One is cone and another one is rod. Uh, the cones are cone shape, less sensitive to, uh, basically to light, uh, and they need uh, a high light. They operate in high light and responsible for color vision uh, in contrast, rods are rod-shaped, right? Uh, they're highly sensitive to light and operate at, uh, at low light, nighttime. Uh, that's why they're actually very sensitive, right? That helps. And then they, uh, they sort of uh, do some sort of gray, gray level vision. Uh, so uh, the, 
the vision corresponding to, to rods is called uh, scotopic uh, versus uh, vision of rod uh, of cones is called uh, phototopic photopic. Uh, and uh, so uh, as I mentioned rods are more sensitive uh, to a single photon uh, something like 100 times uh, then uh, they are slower because they have to integrate over time uh, and that makes them slower uh, and also very sensitive to light at the same time. And in terms of, uh, and, and in terms of numbers, uh, we have uh, 20 times more rods than cones in the retina. And cones, uh, uh, as we saw, mostly happen in the, in the fovea. <coughs> so this is an illustration of that. Again, this is a cone, which looks like a cone. But whereas rods, they are sort of cylindrical structures. Uh, so, so here, on the right, you see that this is basically the uh, the, the spectral profile of of these uh, rods versus cones. So we have three types of cones. This is sort of the average or all the three types. Now compared with the with the scotopic rod vision. Uh, you will see that, and this is basically uh, the sensitivity. Uh, uh, so you will see that first rods are, this is the log scale, so they are sort of like 100, 120 times uh, more sensitive to light, right? The same amount of light will, uh, will excite them, uh, activate them, but not much here, right? And then basically uh, the selectivity sort of, you see they are more kind of, uh, towards the right, the peak, right? So 555, let's say, uh, the, uh, the wavelength nanometers versus 505, uh, which means that basically uh, they are more tilted towards the, the blue light. And so if you want to give a, 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 a basically a perception of night to, then that's what people basically is done uh, in movies, for example, you sort of make the light sort of bluish to give them to give them a sense of like night time because that's where these rods operate, right? That's, that's where the zone of these rods. So bluish light usually corresponds, it get, gets, it gives that feeling that this, this might be the night time. Uh, so uh, here uh, shows basically again that sensitivity, uh, the range of this is called sock matching problem. Uh, so, uh, so Towards the right, basically, is where the cones are active, right? So in the dazzling light, bright sun or snow, on snow, uh, they are uh, they are active uh, outdoors in full sunlight. Uh, and then there's this basically there's this threshold that basically the, these rods start to activate, which is sort of dim light, right? Uh, bright moonlight, and there's a point that beyond that you can actually not see any. You cannot see any. Okay, so, so when you have light, uh, basically cones need a lot of light to operate, and rods basically, uh, they are very sensitive to lights, which means they don't really need that much light to operate, and makes them useful for night vision, right? Uh, so we get that sort of gray level vision, if you will, using the rods, whereas basically for color vision, we use these cones. Okay, uh, so again briefly, so this was the distribution of, of the cones. We, see, we have a lot of them in, the, in this small region, uh, the fovea, uh, or foveola, which is the center of the fovea. And, uh, and uh, moving away from that towards periphery, you don't get a lot of, of cones, then uh, the, the rods start to basically, to, we have more of them in the periphery. So uh, what does this mean? It means that actually the color vision just works for the center of the visual field. Okay, so around this, this, this region, right, uh, fovea, then because we have cones and cones are responsible for color vision, so we see color, but if you move to the parafovea, right, peripheral vision, uh, beyond the, 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 this, this high resolution area, the peripheral vision, then because we don't have cones, we actually don't see color. It's just this illusion that we see things colored, but actually experiment has shown that we, for these peripheral areas, 
we don't see color, right? But yet we have this perception that things are colored here. And uh, you see there are a lot of sort of redundancies, this, this, because we move our eyes, and so sort of this gets in painted, if you will, if you will, by other, uh, by other mechanisms and perceptual mechanisms that we actually think everything is colored. But beyond this phobia, uh, everything is gray scale because you don't have those cones. Okay. So here is actually like for me it's gray scale, here. Right? But still, I, I, we feel that it's colored. Okay. So uh, we have three types of cones. Uh, uh, so the short wavelength ones, are basically sort of corresponding to blue, uh, for 40 uh, nanometer. Then we have two ones that are closer to each other, for 530 and 560. And the reason why they're close, uh, uh, I don't know, but maybe some sort of statistics of this of the board for for primates for us has made them closer to each other for just optimality reasons, things like that. Uh, so here is for the blue ones. You see that it's this interspersed, and uh, uh, so blue ones, green ones, and so on. And as I said, if you for each location, if you want to know what color it is, basically you sort of do some averaging of of these ones that at that location. Uh, so again, this is another illustration of that. Uh, we talked about rhodopsin which was that basically retinol, uh, this structure uh, that when you shine light, project light, it gets activated. And that's basically, uh, that's this, the same protein with the genetic mutation, basically some, uh, it creates three different types of cones. Uh, that rhodopsin is one conformation will result in S cones, another one with M, and another uh, short wavelengths, medium wavelengths, and another with Basically, uh, some genes on and off, you will get different, uh, different cones from the same, same protein. Uh, this is uh, uh, the, the, the basically the sensitivity uh, as a function of wavelengths. So, uh, so this is basically the red cones. They, this is the, uh, the, the basically how sensitive they are to these higher wavelengths. And interestingly, you see that they do not peak it doesn't peak at the, at the red zone, right? So, not uh, be very clear, but the red is here, but it sort of peaks away a little bit from the, uh, from the red. So we have then uh, blue, green, and this is basically the black uh, curve is for the, uh, for the rods, okay? Any questions so far? Okay. Uh, so, so here is basically that the the, the concept of uh, trichromaticity, chromaticity, uh, and if this picture basically, if you sense it with these uh, three different uh, cones, you will get a, just like RGB images, right? You will get a, a short wavelength, which will be active, basically the ones that are corresponding to blue, you see that, and the other ones will be black. Here, the ones that are medium wavelengths corresponding to, to green, you see the green objects, right, the greenish ones, and here uh, it will be activated on, on, on the reddish ones, but you see the background, which is blue here, is not really active, right? Okay. Uh, so now let's see how we can actually sort of uh, use this, these cones to, to, to sense color. So we said that what we, what we, what we see at the eye is this reflected light, uh, uh, basically multiplication of, of surface reflectance and illumination reflectance. And so now uh, we have three sensors, right? The cone, three cones. Uh, so what they do is actually very easy. They, you just basically look at that and then do integration, right? Uh, so integrate that curve with basically with this kernel uh, and then you get the area of that on that side. Uh, uh, so in this example, and then again you do the same thing with green and red, but here you see the area under the blue one from that curve is high, 
and not very high for these two. So this basically uh, uh, it can be a code that you can use to sort of uh, get the idea of that. We get to that more, uh, but so this is basically the response of these three cones for that uh, reflectance uh, light. Right, so that's the integration shown in this equation. Uh, right, so the L is for the uh, long wavelengths, and then, then you integrate that, that this quantity. Uh, okay, so, so here's the concept of uh, uh, basically the, so it's, it's called univariance. And what it means, it means that uh, basically, if you have a if you have a neuron, and uh, as uh, Lindsay mentioned, they have uh, tuning curves, right? So, uh, so if you get one measurement, right, you cannot really fully tell what was the stimulus at that point, because it could be like if you if you cut this curve horizontally, right, for the same basically for this for the same uh, response, it could be two different uh, quantities, right? Right, so if you have this tuning curve, if you cut it like this at these two points, right, you don't know that activation was actually for this color or for this color or this orientation, that orientation, right? So how can we solve this? We use populations of neurons, right? Uh, so what happens here is that now if you uh, so basically, what I'm saying is that using just one code, you cannot really tell uh, uh, what what is that, uh, what was the actual color. Uh, now, if I uh, if I have several uh, several neurons, and then uh, uh, so let's say uh, uh, so let's say if if these neurons right, I get the response from each of them. If I get a code like this. And then I can associate this with blue, right? Because at this, this wavelength, let's say I send it to multiple neurons. Uh, so red responds less, green a little bit more, and then a lot of blue. So this sort of could be code for my blue, right? And then the green here, for example, so I get a lot of green. And, and so it's not like, uh, so all of these respond, but then this is this distribution that can tell me what would be this, right? If you were just to look at one value, you cannot really tell that accurately. But if you look at the response of several, uh, for example, here purple, uh, so you get a lot of response from uh, something that is purple, right? If you send it to these neurons, uh, each of them having a different sensitivity, and then some, you get some blue responses, right? Not, uh, not many green, not much green, and then you'll get a lot of, you get a lot of red, you get a lot of blue, and that's how a purple looks. So, so you can tell this is a purple color, right? Uh, let me see if I. Right. So just a little bit more clarification on this. So if I have a, basically. A big patch, uh, basically, that at, at that location that you see, you get that code, right? But I can get the same code, uh, maybe with a, sh with a with much tinier, because that also you integrate under that curve. If you have a very smaller, uh, a smaller dot, you can sort of make that that same code, uh, but using another sort of combination of these. Uh, that's, I'm trying to make a case that why you should look at the population cause as opposed to just single, uh, single, uh, single neurons. Uh, we'll get back to this just a little bit later. Uh, yeah. So wouldn't the brain make it easier for itself if it had like less overlapping cones? Less overlapping cones uh, in this. Yeah, but that depends on, uh, okay, so to, if you want to design these things, right, you need to know what you will perceive, what will be the statistics that you will see at the end, right? 
so the, the, the design of this actually depends a lot on sort of uh, on sort of things that you will encounter in your uh, in your environment and if you if if it was like that uh, so maybe this helps you to sort of sometimes disambiguate these things having get them closer to each other you know so it's it all depends on uh, how you get the statistics of the world then yeah Yeah. The reason it won't be you look at just the raw intensity is because your graphs here, of course, are like symmetric, right? So you do here, you do here, you get the same intensity, so it's not you. If you were to use one, one, one of them, right? Exactly. That's, that's the reason yeah. for the but if you use a population, you can disambiguate this guy. Right. Exactly. Because this signature that you get at the bottom is going to be unique for each other. Okay? Can you elaborate a little bit? Uh, <laughs> like, like a spectrum can be like any arbitrary function, right? Yeah. So, and you're projecting that into a three dimensional space. Yeah. So there's an infinite number of dimensions that all project to the same RGB activation. Right. Yeah, so I think, I think what they're, they're saying is if, if you, there's multiple different spectrums, you could have the same problem with that. Okay. So let me, let me go ahead and we can go back to those at the end. Uh, to hopefully things will get uh, more clear. So, uh, so, so the white color, right? I mean, it helps us to sort of, species to sort of uh, figure out when is, uh, an apple is ripe to pick it or things like that in the environment, right? Uh, so that sort of helps uh, to, to, to basically live an environment. Uh, so if you didn't have that, you wouldn't be able to sort of function, right? Uh, so uh, basically, sort of uh, foraging and uh, and tasks like that. Uh, so uh, an example of this is the retina of a fruit eating monkeys, which they have just two types of cones, and that's basically uh, enough for them uh, to picking uh, the fruit that they want, right? And that back goes back to the question why uh, those are like that. They're not more separated from each other. This, again, goes back to, uh, to the statistics of the, uh, of the visual world. And uh, the whole thing has been evolved for that, right? Uh, uh, okay. So also for uh, basically mating, uh, so... Uh, Male skin usually is darker than female skin, uh, and then uh, the female faces usually there's a more uh, contrast between facial components, and uh, so if you want to make someone to look a bit more uh, feminine, uh, then you sort of try to increase this contrast between uh, uh, these components. Uh, okay, so uh, uh, so. We, we said three types of cones are enough. Uh, we, have just, uh, we, have, we have three of those. Uh, but what, why can't we have uh, even more number of, of cones? Any, any speculative answer to that? Yeah. Yeah, but what uh, what might be one like uh, limitation of that, right? Let's go back to here, uh, right? So here, as I said, right? So you need to sort of average over each special location uh, here, right? To to read from those three cones to figure out what is the that population code that you want for each location, right? You have to look at the population of the of these ganglion cells there to read out the color, right? Uh, so if you want a lot of different types of these, imagine what happens, so you have to carpet a lot of those in this location, 
right? And that's going to take a lot of space here, right? What it entails is that I'm going to lose a lot of visual acuity. So it's going to get much coarser because I have to come to pack a lot of different gang ganglion cells in one small region, in one region, right? Which means that now my, my vision is going to get coarser and coarser because I have to pack a lot of them. So right, that's why we cannot have a lot of those. Unless you could do this like vertically like this, but uh, that hasn't happened. So in a flat surface like this, you have, you have to compromise between how many different types to basically compromise between color vision and visual acuity, right? So visual acuity turns out to be much more important because you need these forms to understand these forms, edges, and shapes, and everything. Uh, but you cannot compromise all that with, with just color, OK? Uh, So that's why we cannot. Uh, but there are some uh, some uh, some species like this mantis shrimp has 15 types of cones. Uh, uh, maybe it's just just helps helps it to sort of figure out what kind of food is is very good for it. Right? It's just open the mouth, grab it based on the activation of that of that ganglion cell. Uh, some. Uh, most mammals have two types of cones. Uh, owl monkeys, for example, have just one type of cone. Uh, and some animals and women uh, have four types of cones. They're called uh, tetrachromats, chromats, uh, which gives them much uh, uh, finer, oh, yeah, a finer color vision. Uh, so this is basically a tetrachromatism, four types of cones. Uh, Here. Uh, so that's basically, this is also how, uh, some motivation for art because we're not really very, very, so, so the acuity, that basically relates back to that acuity versus, uh, versus color region. So the color region is coarser, right? Uh, because it's average on, on blobs and stuff, but whereas uh, for basically, uh, for understanding form and perception of shape and, and edges and stuff, you need much more, much higher acuity. And this has been exploited by some sort of artists to sort of add color, uh, okay, to do these paintings. Uh, so uh, what is color brightness then? Uh, so color brightness is, so this is, for example, red-green color brightness, uh, which you don't have much uh, sensitivity in, in, in discriminating, r r basically. So, so uh, red and green, so it's basically the loss of uh, some types of cones. When I say loss, it's basically the proportion, right? So the, 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 you don't have as many of those cones that you should have. So if you don't have uh, uh, red-green cones, for example, uh, you, wouldn't, you would see something like this. Uh, so if, the, for example, the red, the, the picture on the left, right, this whatever fruit it is, uh, then you see it, it's like this, which you cannot really figure out what is, is it ripe, or pick it or not, right? Or, uh, or, uh, or for example, when you're driving, and I'm actually colorblind, so I cannot really help you much here, uh, but when I drive, I have this problem, these flashlights, for example, I, I don't know really it's green or it's red, uh, it's just, Leap of face, just go, and then hopefully you won't get a ticket or something. Uh, and uh, <clears throat> so, uh, uh, in terms of stats, males are uh, more prevalent. Uh, eight of eight of uh, out of 100 Caucasians, five out of 100 Asians, three out of 100 Africans, and probability in females is 10 times much less. Uh, I think I added this just to tell you how uh, it would look like. So normal is above, uh, is, uh, is above and dichromatic perception of uh, red and green apples here. So uh, it's basically, I guess if you have two, 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 two of those channels, it will look something like at the bottom. But, uh, so the reason for this, uh, uh, for this, there's actually a nice genetic explanation for, uh, 
for color blindness, uh, why males are more basically uh, uh, prone to, to be, become uh, color blind. So, so if you have a, an, an affected father, so by the way, this is encoded on the X chromosome, right, on the, on the female. Uh, so if basically, if you have a healthy unaffected father with X and Y, and you have a career mother, right, which is basically this, uh, this is affected X chromosome. Now, if you look at the kids, then consider all those four combinations, right? Uh, uh, so if you get the X from dad and Y from, uh, so, sorry, X from, uh, the healthy X from mom, Y from dad, then you get the good X chromosome here, you'll be fine. Uh, whereas girl is going to be basically XX. You, if you get the good X from mom and bad, uh, and good X from dad, you get an unaffected daughter. But then the affected X with paired with, uh, with, the, with the X of dad, you get a career daughter. But the bad thing happens is that if you get this X, uh, basically affected X from the from the career mom and then why, then this would be an affected son, uh, right? Uh, and then uh, playing with the statistics, so again, you see that uh, you, you will get one basically affected son in this case and one career daughter and then uh, basically playing with statistics, you will see that, uh, uh, so, so then, uh, if, if there's an example, if you have 8% 8, 8 of, uh, of variants of a given gene are defective, then probability of a single copy being effective is 8%, uh, which means that, which means that, uh, so basically that 8% is here, right, for the for affected son. If that X is 80%, 8% of the time defective, then you get the son 8% uh, of the time defective. But for a mom, for a girl to how to be really uh, affected, then it means that, uh, basically it means that both X's here should be, uh, so, so both X's here how to be affected. So the reason this is, this is still okay because the good gene on the X is present still, okay? But for both of them to be defective, you have to get 8% here, 8% here, multiple of those is gonna be 0.64% uh, of the time. So for a male to get affected, you have 8%, for a female, you have 0.64, which you see there's much higher probability it's just a sample of, of, of calculations of like this. But the point is males are much more effective because it happens on the, on the X of the, of the female. Uh, some examples, uh, I don't know if this, uh, this projector allows it, but let's skip this. Uh, go back to some mechanisms. Uh, so we said that we have three types of cones uh, okay, let me just quickly skip this one. So I think I'm running out of time. Uh, so one point here is that this this displays that we had cut ray tubes, right? Uh, basically, what there are three guns, and basically to to so for each location, you basically project three three three. You have three guns, right? And then basically. Uh, those are so close to each other that we see them as one point. But there are actually three points that each time you want a color of those, you turn on w the one that you want, right? But there are three locations, but when we see them, they're so close that we just see them as one point, okay? And that's how they work. And pretty much similar to what I, I, I said about the, uh, the retinal ganglion cells. Uh, so I'm going to kind of skip some of these to just go to some points. Okay, so one uh, cool experiment here. So uh, it's called uh, it's called uh, uh, After Effects or adaptation. So what I want you to do, you just look at that cross and just fixate that. Okay, for for a short while. Let's say a couple of uh, seconds. Just 
focus on that cross and do not move your eyes. Okay, now look at this image, at this cross point again. What happened? You should, you should see something like this. Okay? So, uh, this is called after effects. It's like these wheels also, when they rotate, when they stop, you see them rotating backwards, sort of same phenomenon. Now let's, so the red basically here, the red turns into green, and then blue dot, Tends to be yellow. Okay, so let's see what is the phenomenon for this. Chris, how much time do I have? Negative. Yeah. Okay, I'm just gonna finish with this. Okay, so uh, uh, so this this is this can be explained by the by the population codes, right? So uh, uh, so let's say these are basically three neurons, and. Uh, so basically, if I show you this, uh, this orientation, uh, so, so what you get, so let's say intuitively, right? So you have a bunch of ganglion cells, right? And then uh, the population code would be basically, okay. The population code, so what, what you do, right? You have a bunch of neurons, let's say in this case three. And then what you do, you just have another curve here, which is going to be basically for each of those orientations or uh, this is basically for orientation, not color. So for each of these orientation, you see how much total population response I have, right? And then, so this, this one, basically a lot of these tuning curves, and here in the x-axis you say, okay, for each of these basically orientations, how much total population response I have. So you get something like this, right? Let's say, from the population of the neurons. And now what happens is that I'm gonna show you this orientation a lot, Right? So what happens is that these neurons gradually become tired. They're not going to respond as much. So basically what happens is you get something like this. Right? Same as similar, it's not going to respond as, that as before. And then the ones that are closer to this also, they sort of uh, uh, get decreased, right? Dampen. And then here, because you have uh, adapted here, not much is going to happen here, right? Now, if for the same as similar, if I show it again, then you see that the population response here is going to be much lower than the regions, basically, than other regions, right? So what happens, to the, the, basically, what happens to the population response, you will see a shift in the population response. So here, because you have adapted that, right, you're not going to, this, the population response overall is going to go lower, and then here you will have basically higher. So if, if you have a reader, a decoder like this that just wants to see what is the maximum response in the population code, and that's the stimulus, now the maximum location has shifted somewhere else, right? So you have, you have a bunch of neurons, you, have, right? you read the population code to make a decision. Now I have made some of them tired, adapted. Now the population response at that location is gonna be lower, the maximum location shifts and changes my perception. That's how it's happened. The same story with basically with uh, uh, ganglion cells. Uh, we have this center surround, just uh, like Lindsay said, but this is basically we have red uh, center. If you, if you have this concentric circles, you stimulus center with red and off center surround with, with green, basically then uh, they respond, right? So if you have red at the center, you don't have green at the surround, you will get a response here. Sorry, if you have red at the center and you have green at the surround, you, you, you would do this. But now, if I show you a red patch, right, you get a lot of response from these cells, and the ones that are green at the center, red in the surround, you do, they won't respond. Now, if I show you this a lot, right, so these neurons get tired. Now, right after that, if I show you a gray patch, these neurons, because they are tired, they're not gonna sh basically fire as much, and then basically, uh, uh, so these ones now are going to fire more, fire more. Basically, it gives you a different impression of, of this gray patch. Okay, same mechanisms that we talked about here. They're going to they're going to work here. And just uh, uh, just 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 to, to, to with analogy with this uh, 
So what's happening here is in the center surrounds, right? If you have a cortical cell that is center surround, it's going to read out from the, some, some ganglion cells here, right? And then some other ganglion cells in the surround. So a red one, for example, a red center would read more from this red ganglion cells and then from the green ones, like here, for example, from the green ones that are in the periphery. Now you can, we can make also, uh, so this is, this is how it's shown here, right? So if you have red in the center, right, this is what we had, and then green at the surround, this neuron basically, so this, this ganglion cell, sorry, this ganglion cell looking at the red the cones, it will fire. We can have some blue at the center and yellow at the surround, uh, that, that two different types of, of, of this center surround color sensitive neuron, ganglion cells, right? Red, center, red, red plus, green minus, red minus, green plus, blue plus, yellow minus. So this yellow is actually built, we don't have yellow cones, but we can build them from a combination of, if, if I have a lot of basically red and green in the surround, they can form a yellow basically, right? Or you can think of blue minus yellow plus, but those have not been really found yet, okay? So this is basically how you can, you can basically build uh, 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 like filters, uh, and also you, we will see later on, we will have also some, uh, some neurons that are edge selective uh, in the cortex, which they are gonna respond when you see basically, uh, so this is basically uh, uh, luminance only. Uh, so you have basically light bar here, dark bar here, it's like an edge, the Gaber filter, they respond, but the corresponding version of that, you will have basically a red, a red uh, uh, basically border next to something that is not, uh, uh, not basically green, it will respond, or we can have double opponency, uh, basically red. You have a red border, a red, red uh, uh, region right next to a, a green region, and you can sort of combine these two types right next to each other at the same location that can help. Uh, so this is called double opponency, single opponency. So the mechanisms are pretty much like this luminance, but with addition of these color sensitive uh, things. Okay, so uh, I think that's it uh, for me. So I'm Chrissy Inger. I'm from the Center for Vision Research at York University, and I'm gonna be talking to you about motion processing. So in the previous talks, we have talked a lot about um, receptive fields as a sort of primitive of vision. And that's part of the story, but it's not the whole story. So in computer vision, the primitive of vision would probably be the uh, pixels. Uh, and for biological vision, you're inclined to think that it's these receptive fields that tile the whole image in space. Um, but they also tile the image in time. So you have different populations of cells which respond with different speeds that sustain their response over different times. So for example, here you've got some cells with a slow, sustained response in a different population with a very fast but very transient response. Um, so the actual primitive of biological vision is these sort of receptive fields over both space and time. And uh, motion is actually just, it's a really, really central part of vision for every biological system. It's one of the most uh, well-preserved senses, so every single animal can see motion. Some really simple animals seem to only see motion, so things like insects, frogs, uh, this is an example of a visual predator, so it's praying mantis, it eats insects, and if it sees anything that moves like an insect, it will strike, but if it sees just a photograph of an insect or a dead insect, it doesn't strike. Uh, motion is a really powerful cue for grouping, so for example, there's obviously a triangle hidden in this display. See it now? Uh, and then once it stops, it kind of just blends back into its background. Uh, so there's a name for that, which is uh, common fate. It's one of the main principles of gestalt vision that helps you organize the world. I think we also know that structure from motion is a really important way that you can get 3D information out of scenes. So if you have a camera that's sweeping around this image, it's taking multiple views. If you can find some features in those images and match them across the different views, you can build the, both your camera path and the 3D reconstruction of the object. And uh, finally, this may not be as relevant for some computer vision systems, but for biological vision, uh, bi yeah, biological systems, visual motion is a really important cue for monitoring your body movement and just keeping track of where you are in the world. 
So this is picture taken at the Center for Vision Research at York University. We have a tumbling room where we can put people in a chair. We can turn the chair around, spin them all the way upside down. But we can also pick up the whole room around them, spin the whole room around them while the chair stays still. And you get a really compelling sense that you've been turned upside down, even though you haven't moved at all. Uh, and you may have seen this at like movies or those motion simulator rides. Uh, it's the same idea. Uh, and also, if you don't have vision, it's really hard to keep your sense of the world and keep stability. So if you want to challenge yourself someday, try to stand on one foot and close your eyes. Without that optical flow, the motion of the world is really, really hard. Uh, so just to briefly explain what I'll be going through, I'll talk about uh, some really simple circuits that your brain can use to detect motion. And then I'll explain some of the problems with these simple approaches. Uh, tell you a little bit about how motion is actually processed in uh, the main motion processing areas in the brain. And then finally say a little bit about some high level motion processing which includes structure from motion and how you as a moving system would discount yourself motion. Uh, so here's just some diagrams to uh, get you thinking about these reception, receptive fields in space and time. So this is your standard image, it's X and Y, it's got some sort of vertical dark bar. So if this bar moves, we can think of that as sweeping out a series of frames in a video. We could represent that as a volume. So here, time is sort of pointing out of the screen. You've got all these images over time of the bar moving. Uh, every still image is just a single frame pulled out of this volume. Uh, and we can also tilt this volume around. This is looking down vertically into the volume so that you see the bar's movement over x and you see it over time. And the y would be pointing out of the screen. So what are some simple ways to detect motion? Uh, this is a really simple example of a neuron. Uh, it's kind of what you might have in a perceptron or a neural network. So you've got some features that it likes, some inputs. It's going to compute a weighted sum of those features. And if the sum is over some threshold, it's going to fire. So that's its nonlinearity. So how do we turn this into a motion detector? Well, it's really, really simple. Just go ahead and add some spatial difference and some temporal difference. So rather than looking for two features next to each other, we're looking for a feature and then a feature at a slight spatial uh, displacement and a slight time displacement. Uh, you can do that with some, something that essentially adds a delay to the second response so that the two responses will sum at the same time at the summing neuron. Again, you apply nonlinearity. Uh, and here it is, uh, sort of showing it in those volumetric spaces. So again, we're looking down uh, into the image, so we're only seeing a one-dimensional slice of the image, which is space. Time is vertically. Um, so the first cell detects something in its receptive field, it fires. The delayed cell detects it a little bit later, it fires. You sum up those responses to get a response to horizontal motion. Or in the actual visual system, uh, there's a little, might be a little bit of blur, essentially, over space and time. You're not perfectly specific in detecting these things. So you get a cell that looks more like these gabors that we talked about earlier, but this time they're oriented gabors in space and time. And um, this relates to a description of the visual system that was introduced uh, many years ago by Adelson and Bergen. So they described a planoptic function that can be used to completely explain the visual world. So these diagrams are very, very simplified receptive fields for cells that could exist in the planoptic function to describe a scene. Uh, they're not gabors, they're just uh, essentially sharp edge, edge detectors. Uh, the first two are two types of edge detectors that can operate in space on images. So A is a, just a vertical edge detector, B is a horizontal edge detector, C is an example of a filter in space and time. So here it's a uh, essentially just the, the filter from A rotated, it, or sorry, yeah, A. It likes edges in X, but it likes them all the time. It has no uh, sensitivity in time. D is an example of a filter that's only sensitive in time, so doesn't care what's happening, but if the image goes from bright to dark, it responds. Uh, e is an example of an oriented edge in an image, so rather than being vertical or horizontal, it looks for a specific orientation. And F is an example of, a hor of an oriented edge in space and time. So in this case, it wants an orientation along X and T, which means it's sensitive to horizontal movements. Uh, just a few more examples. So suppose you're looking at an image that has some kind of uh, vertical bar that's moving horizontally against a gray background. 
Um, so we're going to say that it's at some distance, moving right with some velo constant velocity, uh, and you, its position is given by x, y, and t, and your position is given by vx, vy, vz. So these are the kinds of images you could get on your retina as the bar moves to the right. So this is the whole volume. It's just two slices through it. The first slice is the image slice. So you see the bar in x and y. The second slice is the temporal slice. So it's the movement in x over time. And it's on the retina, which is why it seems to be going backwards. And these are the slices that you would get from different kinds of observer motion. So if you move to the right, your retina would perceive the bar moving to the left. If you moved up and down, um, this one's sort of funny, but it, essentially, if you move far enough, you won't see the bar at all. You'll see the blank background. You'll just see the bar in the middle. And again, if you move too far, you won't see the bar. And if you move towards or away from the bar, you get this looming function. So this is sort of roughly how we think the brain computes motion. It has these oriented sensors in space and time. Uh, but there's some issues with these really simple setups. So, whoops. If I move this, um, you should be able to see the, the square moving diagonally. Um, it's pretty trivial for you, but if you think about this if, as a you know object tracking problem, this is really not easy to solve. Um, it's true that there is one global correct solution, but working out all the correct correspondences from the basic features that you have to associate is not easy. And it's worse if you think about it from the perspective of just one neuron in early vision, because what it's seeing is this. It only gets a really limited view of the image, and it, in its limited receptive field, it might have a completely wrong perception of the motion. Um, so how do you build the whole global percept from these incorrect initial percepts? This is another example of a correspondence problem. So here the car is driving forward, but if you look at the light spokes on the wheel, you'll probably see them moving backwards. And if you look at the very center of the wheel, um, you might see that still moving forward, moving backwards, I'm not sure. Um, so this is a very, very old illusion called the wagon wheel illusion. And the reason it happens is that when the wheel is rotating forward, it projects another image which is unaligned with the first one, and your brain just has to decide how best to align these. Uh, in this case, the wheel moves quite fast, so the projected image has actually moved pretty far. Uh, if it moves far enough, uh, the two projections will essentially overlap, and you won't see the mo wheel moving at all. You can see it moving backwards. Um, essentially, the problem you're trying to solve is deciding how fast the wheel is moving and in which direction. If you're doing this by correspondences, there are 16 possible solutions, and they're actually all correct. I mean, the wheel could be moving very, very quickly backwards. You have no way of deciding that from this image. This is another example of the same kind of issue. So when I pulled this off the internet, it looked like all the stripes were moving vertically and to the left um, because of this wagon wheel illusion. You might see them moving down and to the right, um, but I think you'll see one of those two, right? Cool. Um, none of them are doing either of that. The, again, this is completely ambiguous motion. You have no idea which direction the stri stripes are actually moving. Here are three possibilities. It could be moving up, it could be moving sideways, but every single one of the 360 degrees is a perfectly acceptable solution for matching up those stripes and computing the motion. It just gives you different hypotheses about the, uh, the velocity of the stripes. So here's another example. This is some vertical stripes moving to the left and some ver uh, horizontal stripes moving up, uh, or vice versa, or any direction, honestly. Uh, so again, both sets of stripes are completely ambiguous, and I think in theory you should see them as two separate planes moving against each other in some direction, but you probably don't. Um, I think, again, most people probably see this as up and to the right. No disagreement? Cool. Um, but why? Uh, here's another uh, kind of motion that's a little bit difficult to explain in terms of these early features. So here you probably see bars moving to the left, uh, but they're not. What's actually happening here is there are vertical stripes of the image where this background pattern is flipping its luminance. Um, so black dots become white and vice versa. Uh, and that region of flipping is moving over to the left 
um, but nothing's actually moving. It's just changing colors. Uh, and again, if your motion perception is based on finding these features and tracking them across multiple frames, why would you see this as moving bars versus just flipping luminances? And I'll show one more cool example. So this is another one of these um, after image things that, like Ali just showed. So go ahead and fixate in the center. It's going to count down from 40 seconds. Um, as Ali kind of spoiled, there are after images or after effects for motion, just like there are for color. And it works very much the same way where cells in your brain that are responsive to certain directions of motion are going to adapt and kind of get tired. And then when you see something else, uh, you should see the opposite motion. But what's really cool about this is I'm going to adapt you to these spinning stripes, black and white, and then show you a picture of something completely different to see if the motion actually transfers from these features that induce the motion after effect to a completely different set of visual features. Can you see it? <laughs> Yeah, so it works really well, but note that the features are completely different. So that means that your brain is encoding motion direction in a way that's independent of features. Or so, yeah, independent of the thing that's moving, which is a little weird because it's not like you can have motion in the abstract, like something has to move to be perceived as motion. So what is your brain computing here? Uh, we are pretty sure that the main motion center in the brain is an area called uh, V5 or the medial temporal MT area. It's right in there. Um, I don't know if we've had a chance to really go through the, the diagram, but uh, visual input comes in through the eye, goes to the LGN, goes to V1, which is what Drew was talking about. Passes through a number of other visual areas, uh, V2, V3, and MT as one of these sort of early-ish but kind of mid-level visual areas. Um, this is a diagram view of the same areas. So down on the bottom right is the, uh, the eye, the retina, going into V1, which is that stacked region. And then it sort of splits off into the dorsal and ventral streams. So MT is actually on the dorsal stream, which is considered the, the where pathway or the action pathway, whereas the ventral stream is the what pathway or the object perception pathway. Um, there's some interesting things about MT. Uh, we haven't talked a lot about the M and P pathways that they're showing there, but the M pathway or the magnocellular pathway consists of these cells that have pretty large receptive fields uh, and they respond very, very quickly. So they're the quick response, but coarse image, um, lower spatial frequencies, and then the parvocellular pathway has the smaller cells, but they're slow. So motion at, uh, the motion area MT gets its input from the, the magnocellular, the fast, low resolution pathway. Uh, and it also doesn't have color info. So it's just a luminance response, but it's very, very fast. Yeah, so just the highlighted, it's up there. So again, quite early, getting input directly from V1 and some via V2. And the reason we think this is the motion area is thanks to some work by Salzman, Newsom, and colleagues. So they uh, actually put electrodes into area MT in monkeys and they found that there were these uh, essentially columns of cells that responded to motion in different directions. And they tested these cells by showing the monkey motion displays, which had a bunch of randomly moving dots with different amounts of coherence. So in a no coherence display, the dots are 100% random. In a 100% coherence display, all the dots move the same direction, and you can pick any number from zero to 100. And they would um, measure the cell's response to different levels of coherence. So for example, this cell is a vertical motion cell. So when it sees a coherent display of vertically moving dots, it responds very, very strongly. If it sees a display with mostly vertical dots, it responds strongly. If it sees, sees an e incoherent display or movement in any other direction, it doesn't really respond. And the other test they did to show that this really is the motion coding area is they put uh, microstimulation into these cells. So they picked a particular column that responded to motion in a certain direction, like vertical, uh, showed the monkey kind of ambiguous motion displays. So these are only dots going from like negative 20 to positive 20 coherence. Uh, so positive means in the preferred direction, ne negative is in the opposite direction. And for every monkey, the, the microstimulation caused the monkey to be more inclined to respond to movement in the preferred direction. So the open circles are the monkey's normal response. Dark circles are when you add microstimulation to, say, the vertical direction. Monkey's way more inclined to see vertical motion. Um, but does MT include real motion? 
So as I said, this is not a surface moving diagonally. This is some vertical lines and some horizontal lines moving against each other. Uh, but you see it as a moving plaid. So what does MT actually see? So people have tested this by showing these kinds of plaids to MT. So in this experiment by Mobshin and colleagues, they showed different kinds of plaids made up uh, with stripes of different orientation. So for example, zero degree means two sets of stripes that just overlap. So they look like vertically moving stripes. Uh, 90 degrees would be the plaid you just saw. So one set of stripes is tilted 90 degrees to the other. And 180 degrees actually means that the stripes are moving opposite each other. So does the cell see the individual stripes or does it see the surface motion like you see? Well, there are a lot of cells in MT that actually see the individual stripes. So if you do this in V1, you get what's called a component response, which means that it sees the motion of the individual stripes. If you've got 90 degree motion, the, there will be cells that like horizontal motion, they respond to those stripes. There are cells that like vertical motion, they respond to those stripes. But there aren't really cells that see the whole plaid moving diagonally. But MT also has cells that respond to the pattern. So here they've rotated it so that all the, the plaids are moving straight up and you have a population of pattern response cells that really do see that combined plaid motion just like you see. So your percept of the coherent motion of the surface is probably being generated in MT. And mathematically how this works um, is essentially you can combine the two ambiguous motion signals to get a pretty clear unambiguous motion. So breaking it down, the top row is thinking about what you might perceive for, from a vertical bar moving horizontally. Uh, the images are just showing the motion of the bar. And this graph is showing your hypotheses about the velocity of that bar. So um, the dot is the one you perceive, which is that this is just a vertical bar moving horizontally. But you could guess that there could also be some vertical motion component in there that you just can't see because there's no features in the bar that let you see a change in the vertical position. So that vertical line is sweeping out all those possible velocities. It could be pure horizontal motion, it could be horizontal and a little bit vertical, it could be really fast vertical motion with just a little bit of horizontal. All of those are good guesses. Uh, same deal for the horizontal bar that moves up and down. Uh, you can assume that it's just moving up. Uh, you could assume it's moving up and a little bit to the right. Again, all good guesses. And the bottom row is your best solution to the plaid. So if you think the, the vertical bar is telling you there's probably some horizontal motion, the horizontal bar is telling you there's probably some vertical motion, uh, put those two together, your best solution is to say, well, it must be a diagonal motion. So it's pretty intuitive, and that seems to be kind of what MT is computing. There's a little bit of a wrinkle, which is if you play around with the spatial frequencies of these bars and their contrast, you can get people to see a lot of different things. They won't always see the plaid that you expect. So I hope this is running. Yeah. So show of hands, who thinks this is one surface, just one surface? How about two surfaces? A few people? More than two? Really? Um, as you stare at this, you might also see the surfaces moving in different directions, and you might actually be able to flip between those two percepts. So sometimes you see one surface, sometimes two. Oops. Yeah, so if you track the dark bits, you should basically just see one surface. Just try to follow them with your eyes. If you kind of relax your eyes, look at the background, look around the sides of the, the surface, you're more likely to see the two surfaces. And you should also be able to see them kind of moving, like maybe one will be horizontal, move a little vertical. And that's because, again, these individual surfaces are very ambiguous. So this is not really disproving the sort of sum of constraints approach to understanding motion. But it's just showing you that there are more than a few constraints. So it's not necessarily always the case that you're seeing one surface. You really could be seeing two transparent surfaces. And that's an additional hypothesis that you have to consider when you're summing over possible motions and trying to reconstruct the scene. Um, but uh, your perception of motion is very much based on the scene that you re reconstruct from it. So this is an image of some dots just moving left and right. They're not doing anything very interesting. Um, does anyone see anything other than just dots moving left and right? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> what do you see? Cylinder. 
Cylinder, yeah, it's a cylinder. Um, but it's really not. Oops. <laughs> there we go. Yeah, so if you look really, really closely, it's just dots moving horizontally. The change in velocity is why you kind of think it's a cylinder. They violate all sorts of rules of how objects should be constructed. So as you watch, you might be able to see the, the back side of the cylinder become the front or vice versa because it's completely ambiguous. You know, it's, a, it's an open cylinder. Either side could be front. But your front dots can move behind the back dots and be occluded. Your brain doesn't care. Um, there are also versions of this where the dots switch color. The white dots become black or some get deleted. Again, that shouldn't happen on a real, real surface, but the motion cue to depth and solid structure is so compelling, you don't care. Do you have a question? Oh, like with the plaid? Oh, I actually didn't notice that when I was testing this. Um, it may be that the I get both, actually. If I track a black dot, I can make it go either way. Sometimes they are coherent so that the black dots are mostly moving this way and the white dots are this way to sort of make you see that surface. Um, I don't think this is one of those. Um, with the plaid, I think tracking the individual intersections sort of encourages you to think that those are a solid thing, which then tells your brain, okay, this is a solid surface. It's not transparent. Um, but that one I'm not as sure about. Is that it? No, 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 it's not uniform. I, I don't think it's as compelling if it is uniform. So it, it's exactly like a cylinder. It, you know, it, it, yeah, it gets a little bit faster at the edge to make you think it's moving in depth. But it is, of course, just bouncing back and forth. This is another example of structure for motion. And I think this is, most people already know what this is, right? <laughs> yeah. Okay. But it becomes really easy to see what it is once it goes into motion. Um, so you can actually see a lot of cool properties about bodies just from these shapes. Uh, but I think the cool computational stage of this is how you take those dots and conclude that they're elements of solid connected bars and use that to decide, oh, this is a person walking. And again, that's um, sort of a top-down reconstruction of what's happening being imposed on your perception of these really simple, very ambiguous motions. Yeah, so I think we've got a little bit of time. I'll talk a little bit about how you, as a moving creature in the world, can subtract your own self-motion out of your motion percept. Um, so one of the main things you use motion for is to keep your balance, figure out where you are, figure out how you're moving. It turns out that computation is really pretty easy if you think about it. So uh, you can get a sense of your individual motion from the motion of the whole scene around yourself. If you're rotating, you can see features rotating around your axis of rotation. If you're translating, you get a, a looming or receding uh, sensation where all the, the motion vectors are pointing towards the same point or away from the same point. And you can use that to subtract out your personal motion from other moving things in the world. And this is really important because in real life, you're always moving, you're turning your head, and you need to be able to subtract this self-motion away from the real scene. Another really important source of motion in human vision is eye movements. So we're making eye movements all the time. We move our eyes about three times a second. Uh, it causes massive motion of our entire visual field when we do that. So we'd like to be able to subtract that away from the image that we're perceiving so we can see if something else is moving. There's kind of two main ways you could do that. So one option, so this is just showing the circuit. You make a command to move your eyes. It's going to move the eye. That's going to generate motion, even if nothing else is motion moving, just the movement of your eyes creates a huge flow field, and that will be sent to the, the motion processing center in the brain, MT, and it has to decide what to do with it. Um, one thing you could do is have a concurrent signal coming back from the eye muscles so that when your eye moves, you have the second signal that says, yeah, the eye moved. Just go ahead and compare that with the retinal signal, and you should be able to subtract it out and decide that there was no motion in the world, for example. The other way you could do it is when you're making the motor command, you could send a copy of that command to the motion centers and say, the eyes are moving horizontally. Go ahead and subtract out that movement when you compute the movement in the world. Um, either of these could work. Uh, which one you would choose for uh, an AI system just kind of depends on which one's more reliable or easier to implement. 
the one that humans are actually using is the bottom one. So we have a motor signal, or copy of the motor signal that goes to our visual center so that it can be subtracted. And if you want to demo how we know that, uh, you can just very gently poke your eye, very, very gently, you'll see the whole world jiggle around a little bit. <laughs> yeah, so, so it's not that your brain gets feedback from the eye that, oh, I've moved. It, it's when you consciously choose to move your eye, you get a signal that says, I just computed a motion, subtract that. Uh, it doesn't work perfectly. So here's an example of a case where you don't quite perfectly subtract out your own movement, and you can actually see movement in the image. So if you read the text on the top and bottom, you might see these two disks spin just a little bit. And if you move your eyes between the centers of the two disks, whichever one you've just left, you might see it rotate just a little bit as your eye is landing. That's because when you're making these saccades, there's a whole motion field that you're generating on your retina. You're supposed to subtract it out, but there's a little bit of noise, especially in the periphery where the spatial sensitivity isn't as good. So we can design images that kind of trick your eye and make you think that the motion in your eye is actually in the world. Is this working for most people? This is fairly old, so it's a very subtle effect. See some people nodding. Okay, so here's the more dramatic version. So people, this is a really cool illusion. People have been evolving it over the years. I think everyone should be able to see this one. Yeah, <laughs> but it's exactly the same principle. So if you can keep your eyes perfectly still somewhere on the image, everything should stop rotating. But as soon as you move your eyes again, they're just gonna start going. And it's stronger in your periphery than it is exactly where you're looking. And it's, yeah, so something to do with the, the clashing colors uh, fools your brain so it doesn't quite correspond the, the visual features correctly. And it incorrectly thinks some of them are moving even though all the movement's on your retina just from your eye movement. Um, so to sum up, we think that motion perception in humans is mostly due to these early visual receptive fields that have filters over both space and time. And um, these receptive fields can build up a sense of the motion in the image, but it's very often ambiguous because motion in images is itself ambiguous. So you can't actually compute global motion from the individual responses. But what your brain seems to do is it um, encodes motion direction independently from other features, whatever features generated the motion. And it uses it kind of probabilistically, uh, allowing an idea of a bunch of different possible motions. Uh, uses that to build a feedforward model of the scene. Once it has a coherent model, uh, that interpretation of the scene tends to work top down to determine how you're going to interpret local motion. And you can switch, switch your perceptive local motion uh, pretty easily, depending on the interpretation in some cases. So that is it for me. Any questions? I don't know. Um, I would guess that the self-motion percept is pretty well preserved across evolution because it's the same signal no matter who you are, if you're a bug or a human. Um, yeah, I'm not sure if that's been tested though. Sorry, yeah, Mats? Sure. Um, so some of the self-motion signal is actually used when you interact with the world yourself while you're moving, so is that something you
Well, you get a very good sense of depth even from 2D planar motion. Um, I actually don't know how much that interacts. Like it certainly does. Like you, you would have filters for certain, like, certain disparities, certain moving objects in depth. Um, so your initial motion percept is in fact 3D. Um, but you'll notice from these 2D examples, if the motion percept is telling you it's 3D, that more than most other cues will start to overwhelm your binocular perception that it's really not 3D. So yeah, I'm not sure exactly how it interacts. It, it interacts with binocular motion, you know, to the point where it can start to overwhelm it. Yeah. It's, well, it's partly practice. Um, so a lot of the instructions I was giving were to fixate at different locations. So when you fixate at a new location, your foveal perception moves, what's in the periphery changes. Your periphery tends to have a coarser representation of the scene and it's more likely to kind of uh, infer what's going on based on what it sees in the fovea. But it's kind of a complex process. So figuring out exactly why this foveal representation compels you to see this peripheral representation can be a little complex. Uh, for most of these reversible percepts, if you just wait a little longer, you'll see them switch. Um, so the, the speed of switching, especially in these completely ambiguous, completely balanced cases, is very idiosyncratic. Um, and, and you get better at forcibly switching your percept with practice, especially practice with these specific demos. I don't think you can tell yourself never to switch, and in fact, I know with things like the ambiguous dancer, the cylinder, um, binocular rivalry, which is where we put completely different images in the left and right eye, those cases you cannot tell yourself not to switch. It'll happen eventually. Your brain just switches automatically. But you can, with a lot of practice, try to force yourself to see one or the other for as long as possible. <laughs> 